Michael already mentioned earlier that Toronto today is going through a gold rush. We have a permanent, uh, it's basically a construction site. The last seven years I came to Toronto on a yearly basis and in some neighborhoods I was not able to recognize the city anymore. So it's an extremely rapidly changing city and on the one hand side it's extremely exciting, specifically being an architect it's very exciting. Uh, on the other hand side, it's also sometimes a little bit scary, maybe. The block-to-block -block by, zo uh, block -block zoning, for example, was a terminology that scared me a little bit. Um, the, our last speaker today is representing the position of um, the developer. I'm, I'm very, very happy that David Delaney was able to come today. Uh, in the preparation of the symposium, we were talking a little bit about what an interesting um, component might be for you as young architects and designers and we came a little bit to the common ground that it would be really interesting for us to learn what the objectives and interests for a developer are aside of um, the development of capital and the dollar for sure. I mean we are, we are investing in our cities and we want to keep the quality and we want to improve quality and we want to design vibrant cities and this is for sure also an interest uh, of a developer. And Freed Development um, has a, a subtitle. It's designing, um, the, the subtitle is design-based development or designing development by design. And um, I'm very excited to introduce David today, who is going to guide us a little bit through the background of the company and will also introduce some projects. In addition, David is, uh, also an architect in, uh, when it comes to his own uh, background. David is a real estate professional and a graduate of the Masters of Architecture program at the University of Toronto. He is a development manager at the Freed Developments, a condominium developer based in Toronto, Canada, obviously. He is also a board member of the Art Access Fund, a charitable organization that awards arts scholarships to Toronto youth as well as a funding founding co-chair of Access, a fundraiser in support of the Art Access Funds. Davis is an active supporter of the University of Toronto as well as the University of Toronto's architecture program, and I'm very happy that he came today to Waterloo. Um, we talked a little bit about this, uh, his topic in the beginning, and I'm really, really happy that you could make time today. Thank you, David. Okay, thank you, Mona, for the uh, for the introduction, and uh, thank you for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, as uh, Mona was saying, uh, I uh, studied architecture uh, at the University of Toronto, um, and uh, had uh, had a fabulous time doing it. I absolutely loved it, uh, and it's very exciting for me to be here. Um, so I'm going to talk about three things primarily today. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about where I work, free developments. Uh, I'm going to briefly walk through some of the projects in the King West area, uh, which I believe is, is near to a site that you guys are focusing on. Um, and lastly, I'm going to zero in on uh, two of the projects that uh, we've been working on and uh, talk about some of the broad themes uh, in condominium development. So this is uh, an assortment of articles. Um, uh, sort of all about Peter Freed and all about Freed Developments. Um, so Freed Developments is a Toronto-based developer. Uh, it was founded uh, by Peter Freed in 1990. Uh, it started as a one-man shop, uh, and today it still uh, retains a very entrepreneurial feeling. Um, and uh, it started actually in the suburbs, uh, in Brampton and Pickering, uh, doing subdivisions, uh, single-family houses. Uh, primarily joint ventures with other developers. Uh, and so the first two projects were an 840 uh, lot um, single family house uh, subdivision um, and 140 single family lot subdivision. Um, so after these, these two big uh, suburban projects, uh, Peter went on to uh, do three smaller townhouse projects uh, in the greater Toronto area, mostly on the outskirts of Toronto. Um, and then eventually he transitioned into uh, the condominium business um, and became very, very successful as an infill condominium developer in the King West neighborhood. Um, so the first site that, uh, that Peter bought was in, or the first downtown infill site that Peter bought 
was in 2003, and it was 66 Portland. Um, it was 66, sorry, 85 unit condo, very small, about 100 by 100 feet, which is uh, pretty much the sort of smallest lot size you can use in downtown Toronto in order to make a, make a, a profit. Uh, and this is just a, a site map of, uh, of all the projects in the area. So um, we, were, uh, we were one of the first developers in the area. Uh, it happened uh, early 2000s. Um, there was a, sort of a municipal movement, I believe that started under Barbara Hall, um, that rezoned this area from an employment uh, district into a uh, <clears throat> mixed use area. Uh, and when that happened, uh, the property values actually skyrocketed almost overnight. Uh, and Peter was in the right place at the right time. He had some friends in the area. Uh, and he was able to tie up some land and uh, buy a bunch of land there. And uh, to date, he's developed about 1,500 units in the neighborhood. Uh, so for any of you that have been sort of in this area in downtown Toronto over the last couple of years, you'll notice that there's rezoning applications all over the neighborhood. Um, there's these projects. Allied REIT has a ton of, of various office projects going up there. Uh, Minto, lots of other developers are going in there. Uh, and it's been completely transformed. Uh, so it's quite exciting. So uh, these are just some statistics about the projects that we've done. Uh, on the left, um, this is uh, the Thompson Residences. It's uh, currently being built. Uh, it's by Saucy and Perot. Um, uh, they're the architects. Um, and uh, it's going to be an exciting project. Very big rooftop pool. We're marketing it as the biggest rooftop pool in North America. Um, and uh, so it should be, should be interesting up there for sure. Um, Fashion House. Uh, this one's been under construction for about five years now. There's going to be a keg steakhouse and uh, heritage building there. I'm just going to run through these quickly, actually. So on the left, uh, 500 Wellington. Uh, this is a, probably our most upscale project. It's, uh, I believe, 17 units um, and uh, very, very nice, very nice place designed by Core Architects. So moving along, skipping through this. This is just a collage of, uh, of all the projects that we've done uh, in the neighborhood. <laughs> it's called Freetown, exactly. Uh, okay, so um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about 60 Colburn. So this is one of the projects that I'm working on. Uh, it's uh, our first project that's outside of, uh, of the King West area. It's at, uh, it's at Church Street and, uh, and uh, King East. Um, and uh, it's designed by, uh, excuse me, uh, Architects Alliance. And um, so it was bought in 2011. Uh, this is uh, just a quick site map. You can see, uh, let me get out my. This is the, uh, the first lecture that I've ever given. Um, so before I, uh, before I came here, I made sure to go to uh, Grand and Toy and get a laser pointer. So, so our site is right here. So, uh, and this is a, a photo of our site. That's Peter, and that's Peter Clues from Architects Alliance. And behind them is uh, a strip of land, a um, north-south small strip of land. Um, actually, let me see. Sorry. So that would be this strip of land right here. And this is our site. This is a site plan. So. We've got uh, Church Street here and then King Street up here. Going back. Okay, so this is uh, just a quick acquisition analysis. So the land was bought in 2011 for uh, about $20 million. Um, and uh, so you can just sort of see how we look at it. So we look at everything on a per, per foot basis. Specifically, the most important thing is net saleable area. So you can see that the land, I can't actually really see it here, but you can see the various costs and how they're broke down. And so you can see the final number. So it actually costs us $620 a foot to build this building. Now, just to give you some idea of the sort of business side of it, we sell this project for an average of $690 to $700 a foot. And it takes about five or six years to build. 
So the margins are actually pretty skinny. You make about $80 for every foot you sell, right? And that's over a five-year period. So the reason that, that this business can be very profitable and has been very profitable in the last sort of 10-year period in Toronto uh, is because it's so highly leveraged. Um, so you'll see, uh, if you look at the capitalization chart, I think it's somewhere here. We only put up about 15% of the capital, and the rest is actually through loans. Um, so, uh, so it's an exciting business, but it is a risky business. So this was our uh, rezoning application. Uh, more sort of themes uh, that I'd like to touch on today, and I think that you'll sort of see reoccurring uh, throughout this talk, uh, is the idea of rezoning um, and the importance that it has for the development process. Um, and also, just you know, sort of the fact that what you start with, with the building design, uh, is almost never what you end up with. Um, and a big part of that is the iterative process that um, is design, as I'm sure all of you have experienced. But another big part of it is the zoning process and uh, the various sort of pushes and pulls that take place between the economic factors and the zoning factors and the creative factors and the various personalities uh, that are involved in, in making a building. So just really quickly, this is our underground, uh, underground parking, not too much there. So on the ground floor, uh, We've got three retail spaces. Uh, in almost all of our projects uh, that we do that are on sort of major avenues like Church Street or like King Street, uh, we try and incorporate a retail aspect. Uh, and that's, it's, it's good in the sort of uh, urban design sense uh, in that it activates, uh, it activates the, the ground plane um, and it opens it up to the public in a certain way that if it were just a condominium lobby, it wouldn't do. Um, but also from an economic point of view, um, it's one of the most lucrative parts of our business. So we'll build these spaces here, and by the time they're actually built, it typically, it typically costs us less to build them than we can get it reappraised and refinanced for. So it's, it's amazing, actually. So this is a typical floor plan. Um, now, one of the sort of big changes that... Uh, that occurred when we were designing this building and going through the rezoning process um, was we actually had to shift the core of the building um, two meters to the west and about a meter to the south. Uh, and when you're dealing with a business such as real estate development, where, as I was saying, it's so highly leveraged, everything is done with borrowed money. And when you're dealing with borrowed money, time is of the essence, because the longer you take to pay it back, obviously, the more money you have to pay. So in the case of this project, what we actually did was we actually went to market and started selling the project before we had gotten our zoning. And so that was, that was very contentious, to be, to be perfectly blunt. Uh, we faced huge opposition in the neighborhood, um, but um, we went to the OMB, um, and uh, you know, we're, we're confident that it will go through, um, and you know it's definitely a, definitely a popular building. We've won we've won a bunch of awards for it. But um, it's important to understand that uh, that this is actually a pretty common thing. So uh, this is one of the features that we use in a lot of our buildings. It's the idea of uh, an elevated pool, um, and it's sort of a lifestyle thing. Um, and it's something that we use for marketing purposes. I mean, people love it. People love buying buying units um, in buildings that have pools. It's sort of experience that, uh, sort of what we've found. So these are some elevations. So just to talk a little bit about the floor plans. So um, we have an 11-story podium with a feature glass element here. Uh, so this is going to be back-painted glass. I'm going through. So the small units. So this is quite controversial. And actually, over the last two years, uh, some of the Canadian banks have actually stopped giving construction loans to projects that have too many small studio units in it because they're worried about investors. Um, and uh, so one of the things that Mona was asking me about, actually, before I came here was foreign direct investment. Um, and sort of the impact that uh, foreigners buying condominiums would have on on the market and on the housing market in general, and whether there would be, you know, whether there would be a crash and whether it would be um, whether prices would fall and all that sort of stuff. Um, 
it's obviously a very, very widely discussed topic. It's in the papers all the time. Um, my personal opinion of it um, is that it's, it's certainly dangerous, but there are um, sort of safety mechanisms that we use uh, to try and uh, thwart speculation within, within the business. So most of those safety mechanisms are actually imposed by the banks themselves. So for example, uh, if, if somebody from an outside, if, somebody, if a foreigner, if somebody who's not a citizen buys a unit, they have to disclose that they're not a citizen, uh, and they have a higher down payment that they have to make. It's typically 35%. Um, and, uh, and typically in our buildings, we have less than 10% people who aren't citizens buying. Um, and if we didn't, the banks are actually so stringent that if you have more than 10% people from out from that aren't citizens, um, typically they require you to put up equity in order to, uh, in order to match uh, the amount that, uh, that's, that's, that you don't have, in other words, match the amount that um, match the amount that would be put up by somebody who were uh, who were a citizen, um, and uh, yeah. So, but it's it's an it's an excellent excellent sort of discussion. I'm looking forward to talking a little bit more about it. This is probably my favorite unit in the building. Just uh, lots of. Lots of envelope. The envelope is one of the most expensive parts, and uh, so anytime you can, you see a deal on on one of these units that has a, a high ratio of uh, of envelope to uh, to floor space. It's always a good thing. So. It's some, some of the renderings. We use a firm called uh, Design Store to do most of our renderings. We love working with them. They're, uh, they're a lot of fun to work with. So this, sorry. So this was, uh, <clears throat> this was a sliding glass uh, feature wall that, uh, that we used and we we're sort of toying around with using in the building. Um, it, uh, it's basically at the corners of the building, you have the option to buy uh, two giant glass uh, sliding windows that sort of slide together and open up, open the interior um, to the outside. Um, one of the design elements of the building is sort of this undulation of uh, units that have no balcony and sort of take up the whole floor plate where the balcony would be. Uh, and then other floor plates that, that have the balconies and, and are uh, smaller in terms of their, uh, their envelope. Um, so I thought this was a, this was a really interesting uh, type of uh, design feature. So this was the feature glass that, uh, that we were speaking about. Okay, so 89 Avenue Road. So uh, this is another project that is uh, currently in the rezoning um, stages. Uh, and another project that, again, has gone through sort of massive, massive amounts of change. Um, through the planning process. So this is this site right here. It's 33 feet wide <clears throat> and uh, about 200 feet deep. Um, and uh, just from a construction point of view, that is, that is very, very difficult to build on. Um, originally, we were planning on doing 28 stories. Um, we, had, uh, we had a lot of opposition from the neighborhood, especially from Hazleton Lanes. We had a lot of very well capitalized uh, neighbors, and we actually had 14 people opposing us at the OMB, which I think we set a record for that. We were actually kind of proud of, believe it or not. Um, and uh, so anyways, in the negotiation process at the OMB, we ended up uh, speaking to our neighbors, speaking to uh, the board member, and coming down, sort of settling for 20 stories. Um, <clears throat> This is, the, uh, this is the site as it is currently. There's a Howard Johnson, an eight-story Howard Johnson. Uh, and this is a laneway uh, that enters onto Hazleton Lanes in Yorkville. So it's one of the, as far as condo development is concerned, it's probably the most expensive area in the city of Toronto. And again, a quick acquisition analysis. So sort of the, the quick numbers on this one is that it was bought for... 12.25 million in 2011, um, 
and uh, we just got it rezoned, or we're in the process of getting it rezoned. The settlement is sort of getting ironed out for 20 stories, uh, about uh, 102,000 square feet of saleable area, um, valued at about $175 a foot. So we got it. That gives us a reappraisal of about 18 million. So we had a 50% uh, loan to value mortgage on it. It's about 6 million invested, and we made about 6 million. Take away about a million for, uh, for rezoning fees for a municipal lawyer, or architects, all that stuff. Um, so at the moment, we're just sort of trying to see whether it's actually something that we're going to be able to move forward and build. Um, that sort of requires, uh, that sort of depends on our financiers and uh, sort of whether they want to cash out or whether they want to, um, whether they want to continue to build. Uh, so this is actually this is actually the old scheme, but uh, I'm going to just go through it quickly uh, because our new scheme is actually um, in the process of being created and it's very very schematic at the moment. So one of the cool things about this project is because it's so narrow, there's insane parking sort of uh, uh, restrictions. You you can't put a ramp; it's impossible. It's way too narrow. Um, so we're using uh, if it gets built, we're likely going to use. An automated parking system, uh, a company uh, down in New York called Boomerang makes this. Um, and it's actually uh, skids, um, robotic skids that slide underneath the car in the elevator, pick it up, and then drive it into location. And there's actually uh, wires set in the concrete that guide it. So it's pretty cool. <laughs> so this is an interior courtyard. Um, so you drive in through here. This is sort of drive court, drive court, excuse me, pull into the elevators and then go down. Uh, from Hazelton lanes, walk through here, go into the sort of private entrance in the back and go up. Uh, and from Avenue Road, uh, walk through here, jump in the elevators, go up. You got a, again, you've got a scissor stair here, really trying to make use of uh, sort of the most efficient use of space as possible because it's just such a tiny site. Uh, and then again, our sort of feature pool, as I said, we, we really love pools um, and uh, sort of bar area here. And then big units. So these are these are big units, um, you know, uh, four, four units of floor, two units of floor. Just a quick elevation. So we have sort of uh, <clears throat> metal uh, type screen system that we're hoping to put on the building. You can start to see it here. <clears throat> and there's that screen system again. So it actually opens up. So there, that's a, that sort of illustrates how it works or how, how we hope it will work, let's say. So it slides open, and then you have sort of a interior glass balcony, um, similar to, to what we were doing at 60 Colburn. <clears throat> and then this is actually the sort of revised scheme, the settlement, um, to which we are arriving at the Ontario Municipal Board. And you can see uh, the height that we had sort of originally proposed and the height that we settled on, and then how we sort of elongated the floor plates. Uh, in order to uh, make up for the height that we lost. Um, so just a couple of points in conclusion. Um, so, so a couple of things that, that I think it's important to note for a developer. Uh, you see a lot of developers that really focus on sort of cookie cutter uh, condominiums or houses, um, things like that. Um, I think that in an urban environment, uh, such as Toronto, such as downtown Toronto, you're starting to see the emergence of developers that actually really focus on design. Uh, and I think that's really important thing for, for two reasons. The first reason uh, is that I think design really enhances the quality of life of the person living in the building. And I think that's that's a pretty, as architects, it's probably a pretty ubiquitous view. Um, but the second and equally important reason uh, is that good design sells condos, plain and simple. 
Um, so I think it's important to, to sort of recognize that as well. Um, so the second thing is that the planning process in real estate development, no matter how hard you try, it's going to alter the design of your building. <laughs> it's just something, something you got to accept. Uh, and then the third point uh, is that probably the most exciting opportunities in real estate, uh, in real estate development and in condominium building, uh, is balancing the economic realities with the creative ambition. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure to be here. I appreciate it.